Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, it's really great to be with you here today. I want to thank Kevin Song for uh, their partnership with Beaumont, uh, which we value greatly. And uh, we are looking forward to that partnership strengthening and growing as Beaumont moves forward with our behavioral health growth strategy, which you may have heard us from this already, but um, if you'll indulge me just so I can tell you about the exciting things we have, not just for Beaumont, uh, but for our community, for Southeast Michigan. Uh, we recently broke ground on our behavioral health hospital, which will be located across from uh, Beaumont Dearborn Hospital. It will be opening next year. Uh, associated with that will be our first psych psychiatric residency program, uh, which we're currently hiring faculty for now. Our first class of residents will be uh, joining us next year. Uh, we will also be adding a psychopharmacology residency program as well. Um, in addition, we are currently working on our uh, comprehensive ambulatory behavioral health strategy so that we have an entire continuum of care to do this uh, vital work, uh, to do it better, because our community deserves it and all of us, our society deserves us doing this better. So it's such an honor to be able to introduce Dr. Joyner, uh, whose work has been so instrumental in moving this field forward. Uh, and doing such a, a, a forward-thinking, progressive job um, at, the, at what we're gathered here to explore. Uh, Thomas Joyner grew, grew up in Georgia, went to college at Princeton, and received his PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Texas at Austin. He is the Robert O. Lawton Distinguished Professor in the Department of Psychology at Florida State University, Tallahassee, Florida. Dr. Joyner's work is on the psychology, neurobiology, and treatment of suicidal behavior and related conditions. In addition, he's a consultant to NASA's Human Research Program and is the director, along with Dr. Pete Gutierrez, of the Department of Defense-funded Military Suicide Research Consortium, a $30 million project. Would you join me, please, in welcoming Dr. Joyner? Good morning. Appreciate that kind welcome and introduction. <clears throat> I had a chance yesterday to talk with you a little bit about some emerging ideas in my program of research, and I wanted to pick up there and expand. Uh, for those of you who weren't here yesterday, I'll, I'll loop you in um, and get us all on the same page. Uh, before I do any of that, some preliminaries, the usual things. My email address is up there. Feel free to email me. Um, if you need an answer to a question you don't get to ask or any materials, etc. cetera. Um, speaking of questions, yesterday we did it just sort of as they come. It worked all right, I think. So we can do that again. I'll, I'll try to get to all the questions as they arise. We do have microphones floating around, so we can do a hybrid you know, mix of using those microphones, or else I'll just hear it and repeat it into the mic myself. Uh, I am going to show a couple of videos today, and they're, um, at least in one case, talking about behaviors, um, and in another case, maybe actually enacting some behaviors that are uh, in the crisis neighborhood. Uh, nobody's going to get hurt in these clips, much less killed, but if you find that kind of stuff upsetting or provocative or what have you, I just wanted you to know about that up front. All right. I wanted to contextualize things with this background, which don't worry over the details of it. Just check out the blue line. It's going up and up and up, relentless. These are U.S. suicide rates over the last decade or two. And this is a well-known in this room, I think, fact that we in American suicide research, American suicide prevention circles need to face, grapple with, do better at. Now, I definitely have detected in the research community, the prevention community, some notes, I think, 
inspired by this concerning trend along the lines of we need to do things totally differently. Nothing works. We don't know anything. We should change course altogether. Maybe we shouldn't do research at all. You know, you researchers have been doing this for decades, and look, that's, that's a viewpoint. It won't surprise you that I disagree with that viewpoint, but it's a viewpoint. And, and there's a couple reasons I disagree with it. A, the concept of what's called a hypothetical counterfactual. That's a, that's a mouthful. Hypothetical counterfactual. What in the world is that? All it is is what would have happened with this were it not for our efforts? That's the hypothetical counterfactual here. What would that line look like? Absent our efforts. My guess is it would look worse, a lot worse. It could be that if we had the counterfactual plotted, you'd see that we're suppressing that line down towards flattening and then eventually towards asymptote. And in fact, that's what I believe is happening, but we don't have the counterfactual. You can't see it because we don't have it. It's hypothetical. That's A. Here's B. This is from a very recent New York Times article. Now, before we delve into it, let me direct your attention to the quality of the highlighting here. <laughs> I wish I could say, like, my three-year-old grandchild did it, because that's what it looks like, but I did it. <laughs> Still working on the PowerPoint skills. But check out the headline. To the point of this slide, check out the headline. Japanese suicides declined to lowest in over 40 years. And what I've highlighted there, a little hard to see, I, re I realize, even for me, but I'll try to read it. The 10th straight year in Japan of declines when we've had 10 straight plus years of relentless increases. Japanese suicides down by about 40% in roughly 15 years, I think that's what that says. Whereas for us, we're up about the same amount. They're down by that same amount. Overall number under 20,000 in Japan for the first time since record keeping began in 1978. So this story of American suicide preventionists and researchers of woe is us, nothing works. We're not doing anything, it's not true. This story is repeated country after country after country around the world. The problem, more or less, is us. We've got things to fix here. It doesn't mean that the researchers aren't doing anything, the preventionists aren't doing anything. That's not true. It means that culturally, societally, we as a country, we've got some problems, and we've got to address those problems if we want our rates to start to look like this. Here's one thing that I wanted to mention, <clears throat> especially given the title of, of the talk that's listed in your, in your program for me, about the future of an American suicide research agenda. This is a federal effort called, as you can see there on the slide, the acronym for it is PREVENT. Now let's face something head on. P in this acronym stands for president, the U.S. president. A lot of feelings about this president. Try to get your head out of that space. That's not what we're talking about here. Love him, hate him, not, not the point. The point is that this is a directive, an executive order signed by the U.S. president that does a lot of good. It prevents is an acronym. You can see it spelled out there at the bottom. President's Roadmap to empower veterans and end the national tragedy of suicide. This title, it's a, in some ways it's a pretty good title. And by the way, I would urge you to Google this and just read the executive order. Unlike a lot of executive orders, this one's not that hard to read. It only takes a few minutes. And actually, that's kind of a problem that I'm going to get to in a second. But it's a quick read. It's sort of an inspirational read, actually. 
about a vision for the future of American suicide prevention. The title here, though, I think has one unfortunate aspect. It makes it seem like the effort is veteran specific. Doesn't it? It kind of reads like that in a way. And, and I, you know, in a way, that's actually fine with me. That's good. Veteran specific is good. But actually, the intent of this is much broader. And you can see it in the last few words. That's really what this is about, is to end the tragedy of suicide writ large in America. Devil's in details, there are not a lot of details at this point, though the people who are running this, uh, I, I trust. It has, nothing to get, it has nothing to do with President Trump. It has to do with a person, a psychologist, appointed to be the executive director of the effort who's a very capable person. And so there's reason for hope. There's not a lot of detail yet. Uh, and so that's where I hope things emerge. And in fact, this, this order specifies that things have to emerge by law by March of this year. So news will be coming soon about next steps of this. In fact, March 4th, I think, is when that has to be delivered, either March 4th or March 5th because it was signed on March 5th, as you can see there, and it reads, this will be done by a year from today. So coming soon. It's an exciting time in American uh, suicide research. Needed, desperately needed, because unlike in Japan, this is what we're looking at. All right, so I'm going to pivot from that to start following up on what I talked about yesterday, which is to update you on some of my recent ideas about what you might think of as the suicidal mind or the suicidal self. My thoughts along those lines have evolved, actually, in the last year in ways that are new. So this is a little bit of a um, fresh perspective and, you know, probably raw in some ways, but I think there may be promising ideas uh, inherent in this. I, ho I hope so. Anyway, that's kind of the point. And to do that, to start to paint this picture, I wanted to introduce you to this rare, unsettling, and also, to my mind anyway, awe-inspiring and fascinating condition. It's awe-inspiring and fascinating in the sense that what is our minds not capable of? Yes, this is, a, this is a misfiring for sure. When it misfires, it can be awful. But this thing, this equipment, it's amazing. There's an endless stream of thoughts and behaviors and feelings and creativity. Amazing things come from it. Disturbing things come from it. This delusion as we touched on yesterday, is when people are convinced, they have a delusion, delusions are defined as unshakable, fixed beliefs, or a belief system completely, or at least mostly at odds, with consensual empirical reality. These folks sincerely believe that they are literally dead as they walk the earth, as they talk to their psychiatrists, their psychologists, as they interact with family and friends, they're under the sincere belief that they are, at the time, deceased. Here's an example of a patient suffering from this delusion. This patient is presenting to inpatient psychiatry with major depressive disorder, a, a, psychi a psychotic variant of uh, major depressive disorder, and he says, I do, and when he's being interviewed about his state, here's his quote, I do not exist, my body does not belong to me, I do not recognize my organs, I feel I'm dead. In the last several months, I've been reflecting on this delusion and on neighboring delusions of this sort, and asking the question, does this have anything to do with suicidality per se. There's reason to suspect it does. One of which is that many of these patients die 
from this delusion. Many of them kill themselves. I was chatting with Nancy last night and she remarked, it doesn't make a lot of sense for these patients to do that because they think they're already dead. And, I, and my reply to, to her was, that, that's true, that's, that's rational, this is psychotic though. Rationality goes out the window, this is psychotic. That does make sense, but not, that's not how this works because this doesn't make sense. This is, this is a, psych, a psychotic condition. A lot of them die, a lot of them kill themselves, a lot of them starve to death because they don't eat because they're already dead. It's a very suicidal syndrome, A. B, what I've been reflecting on lately is what are the phenomenological similarities between this and, and, and suicidality per se, in, in general. What I mean by phenomenological similarities, just like what do the features look like? Do the features of this have anything in common with the features of usual, quote unquote, suicidality? And I believe that they do. And let me give you an example of usual suicidality. And as I read this, reflect on would that apply to a dead person, a literally dead person? He would sit almost motionless for prolonged periods. Did dead people do that? They're motionless. Speech diminished greatly. That happens in death. Lose weight, yeah. Say he was a burden on his family, he would never get well. You'd never get well from death. Developed insomnia. Talked about wanting to die, being better off dead. I think this condition is a neighboring spot next to this condition on an underlying spectrum of suicidality, ranging from the severe end of conditions like this all the way down towards people who have no thought of suicide, no attraction to death, n none of the above. I'm gonna fast forward to that spectrum idea. Before I do that, do I have a pointer here? I don't think I do, but that's all right. If you look at the far right of this image, it, it reads decayed, detached. That's what I think the feeling, the perception of the genuinely, severely, lethally suicidal mindset involves is a sense that one's sense of self, one's sense of efficacy, and one's sense of agency is in part dead. It's at least decayed, and something that is decayed, not coming back. Decayed things tend not to come back. They think, they feel that they're in part dead. Part of them has died in that previous example. And if that's true, if your sense of self and agency is eroded to the point of decay, what are your hopes and prospects of re-engagement and re-attachment to others? They're low. They're zero, maybe, even. You might think. Now, let's pause here and emphasize. I'm talking about perceptions, felt experience. I'm not talking about suicidal people literally being decayed or detached or irreparable or any such thing. That's not the case. I would never say anything like that. I am saying that the subjective felt experience of it can be like that from the inside. Two different things. What actually is felt on the inside and what actually is true on the outside. Those can be different things. They can also align, but they can be different too. And I, here I'm saying they're different. All right. 8.30 here, I got 15 more minutes or so. Questions? Yes. Uh, Dr. Turner, are you gonna talk about what the Japanese are doing? Sure, good point. I glossed over that. They're doing um, a lot of what is in Prevents, the, the Prevents Initiative, they're doing a lot of that. that. Um, 
and so they don't know which piece of it is driving it. But they suspect, and I agree with them, that a big piece of what's driving it is mandated by the employer. So if the employer has, I can't remember the number, like 10 employees or 50, I can't remember, something like that, some number, pretty low number of a big corporation's number of employees, that corporation's health system or health insurance has to mandate that anybody 40 plus or 50 plus, I can't remember the age cutoff, I think it might be 50 plus, must have an annual depression and mental health screening with a physician. It's mandated screening for everyone specifically about mental health and depression. Um, they think that's a big part of it. I tend to agree. Um, but they're doing a, a lot of simple things about, you know, mean safety, uh, primary care education, including that mandated program, um, post-crisis, uh, including post-discharge, caring, follow-up, repeated caring follow-up. Simple things that we know about. In fact, that came from us, really. They took that from us, from our research programs, and used it and, and, and had political will behind it, got it implemented, and sure enough, when you do all that, tides turn. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yeah, they're higher. The question, just so we can be on the same page, is, is what's their quality of life index? Is it higher than ours? It is. Um, but, but keep in mind, their suicide rate has gone from astronomical down to still higher than ours. So it, it's not a simple story, but the, the thing that impresses me is that downward slope, because they were having a terrible problem with this 20 years ago. Their rates per capita way higher than what we have. And now they've gotten it to where it's about what we have. Incredible progress. Yes? Um, I have a question about the compliance. Mm -hmm. So when somebody is at that point. There's a microphone there, yep. Um, is this too loud? Nope, it's good. Okay. Um, if, somebody, if somebody's at that point of um, that subjective experience of decay and detachment, um, are there evidence-based practices to help yeah. bring them back like what's the what's the strategy when it's to that delusional point if they have cotar delusion the best characterized treatment by far is ect ect, Elect okay. uh, ECT electroconvulsive therapy modern forms of it you know again you, you say that word people think back to cuckoo's nest it's not that all right it's modern the modern form of it is a, a an effective the most effective at least the most tried and true treatment tried and true treatment for that. I do think the restoration of a sense of agency and a sense of connection via skilled psychotherapy is plan B. But it's not plan A because this is so dangerous. It needs to be resolved in hours to days, not weeks to months. It's too dangerous. People die from it. They either starve or they do horrible things to themselves which kill them figuring, what's the difference, I'm already dead. It's, bad. it's a very severe illness. Okay, yes. I think you try to tell us in terms of suicide, uh, we start doing Newtonian physics and really to get to relativity and quantum mechanics on this? Yeah, that's, what, that's an interesting way to put it. So the, um, Actually, I, I, you do, but you'd do better at repeating that than I would. Would, but no, him. He's right there. Are you trying to tell us yeah. that in suicide, we're just doing, luckily, Newtonian physics? Exactly. But we have not done relativity or quantum mechanics. Yeah, I love the way you put it. I, I agree. I, 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 that's very. Sympatico the way, the way that I think and talk. Exactly. And I, I would add in, no, we're more like an Aristotle. Not, 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 Newton, not Newton. More like Aristotle. We got to get from Aristotle to Newton, and then we'll worry about Einstein and all them. 
that's what we're doing. But in all seriousness, though, that we, we, Aristotle knew some things, definitely. <laughs> if you read it, it's amazing, actually, what he knew. Newton, we're talking about physicists, if you're not with us. Um, <laughs> he knew some things. It just, you know, it's just gotten better and better and better with time, and so will this. But we need the time, and we need the minds, and we need the research support. I'm short on time, so I'm going to delve back into this and make a couple more points about this spectrum that's, that's depicted. Do you, have, do you have one more question or no? Oh. I'm uh, over here. I, I'm kind of short. Do you have one oh, more? Yeah, I was kind of right in the guard. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Just uh, going back to the national strategy for research, mm. I'm wondering, um, we have a situation where 20 million Americans don't have insurance yeah. and pre-existing conditions could become... Um, prohibitive for insurance in the future. Primary care doctors are overloaded and there aren't nearly enough of them. Uh, so veterans are having to go outside the VA to get care if they can find it. So I'm just wondering, what, what do you see as a, um, if we have a national research strategy but we don't have the practitioners to implement it, how, is that gonna do any good? Well, that's a very fair question. I don't have the answer to it. Very fair question though. I'll leave it at that. Oh, I've got till nine, thank you. So, all right, still a little bit behind the curve, I would suggest on time here. So let's forge ahead. All right, so we talked yesterday a little bit about the left side of this spectrum, the anti-suicidal and a-suicidal. If you happen not to have been here, anti-suicidal is where people are just they just are afraid of the prospect of suicide. If you ask them clinically, they'll often, you can actually see it in their body. They'll literally physically recoil. Some of them gasp. A, suicidal, a little bit different. They're not suicidal at all. They don't react to it. And as I said yesterday, those are both very low risk groups, but they're not at the same risk going forward. The A, suicidal group, could progress from left to right on this spectrum faster than the anti-suicidal group. All right, Patrick, if you could pull up that video with the title Tharp on it. Let's just listen to at least a couple minutes of it. This is a guy being interviewed in uh, an incarcerated yes, I have. setting. Go, yeah, go ahead, Patrick. See if we can get the audio and the video syncing. Yes, I have, and I've I've cut myself uh, a lot, and I've ingested things like bed hooks. Uh, one time, a cassette Walkman down at Lucasville, breaking it up and swallowing it piece by piece, and uh, you know, bed like I said, bed hooks, razor blades, ink pens, pencils, toothbrushes. October of last year at Lucasville, I ingested four ounces of what is it, Magic Shave? It's what it's called, powdered Magic Shave. It's like Nair, but it's in powder forms for men. Beard remover, hair remover, with ten ink pens and a paper clip, and I still have. The last x-ray, I think, showed five ink pens in the paper clip. How does one swallow? Is it a radio, or what is it that you swallowed? I swallowed a cassette Walkman AM FM radio and just crushed it up in chunks and slivers and just bend my head back and push it down my throat and immediately drink water and swallow it down. And why are you doing that? I do that for many reasons. Sometimes the reasons are I'm depressed or I'm stressed or you know, also just to, you know, what I call pull a move to, you know, go to OSU or Oakwood just to get, just to get out of this environment, the ignorance and, you know, the, the what I call the animal, the animalisticality of all this, you know, just the, the hell of it. You know, I get tired of it, need a break. And OSU and Oakwood, the staff and COs and mental health, they're different, they're real. You know, I can I would say that they're human beings. And one Oakwood is a hosp more like a hospital setting. Yes, okay. Oakwood is a like is a mental hospital for prisoners that are in prison. <clears throat> so. And is that a relief 
to get out of prison? Yes, to just to get out of this environment, get away from it for a while. And and so you so you consciously do that, or is it part of your illness? Or explain to me what that uh, is. I, I consciously do this, and it's a part of my illness. I know and understand that I don't have to do this; that I can control this if I, you know, want to. And it's not that I am stupid or to the point that I can. It's just I don't care when I'm when I get stuck in a thought. I go all the way with it, and, and I <clears throat> and I don't care of the consequences that I'll suffer or I'll cause other people to suffer. All right, if we could put that, yeah, there we go, perfect. If you look at the three words or phrases on the left side of the spectrum, anti-suicidal, a-suicidal, and then in the middle there it says suicidal thinking. Which one would you choose for that individual? I'm hearing a little bit of a murmurous consensus emerging around asuicidal. And I think that's right. There's not a whole lot of frank suicidal thinking there. Neither does he seem phased or put off by any such thing. So that, that excludes him from the anti-suicide. He's an asuicidal case with one addition. He has progressed through an inflection point, getting to the fourth node here, regarding self-directed violence. Should he become suicidal, he's already beyond that inflection point denoted by the double break and will be a very dangerous, very high-risk person who's extremely capable of inflicting lethal violence on himself. Should he get to the point where he has an acute suicidal crisis along the lines of ACSD, or comes to view himself as irreparably decayed and detached from others, should he come to that point, the wherewithal that he has to act on it is extreme, and he's going to do, in all likelihood, something that eventuates in his, in his demise. I'm going to gloss over that comment. It's about impulsivity, but I need to get to something else, and I may have a chance to loop back around to that. But let me get to this, because this is a point of departure for these ideas on decay, detachment, and the like. This may be uh, familiar to many of you. It's a visual summary of what's called the interpersonal theory of suicidal behavior, more or less a three-factor view, arguing that when these three states or conditions converge within the same individual, well then that individual may have the outcome described at the bottom of the screen, death or near death. The three factors being the idea that you're a burden on others, the idea that you're alienated and don't belong with others, and then the, that right-hand quality being kind of what the incarcerated fellow, I think, just showed us. Somebody with a high capacity to inflict real damage, potentially lethal damage on the body, should it come to that, should he come to desire it. However, as some of you will know, this is not a full depiction of the theory. This is. And this gets complicated, it gets complicated conceptually, and then along with that, it gets quickly complicated statistically. What this theory predicts is a four-way interaction, a four-way statistical interaction between the three variables that I just talked about, namely burdensomeness, low belongingness, and capacity, and then with an overlay on top of that of hopelessness about that. Four variables, hopelessness, burdensomeness, low belonging, and capacity. You don't need to know a lot about statistics to understand this, just trust me. When you get 
three variables involved in a statistical interaction, it's complicated. It's already complicated. And when you put four in, an, an order of magnitude more complicated. Those predictions are the point predictions of the theory. And they have been tested how many times total in the literature? I would make the case that that number is zero. In a recent meta-analysis, my own team counted 150 or so tests of the theory. Three of them came at all close to testing either one of those point predictions that I just talked about, and none of them really did it, including our own work, because they're extremely intricate, difficult things to test. So if you hear any of my esteemed colleagues telling you that this theory is tested and, and kind of passe, wrong. That's wrong. It may be passe, I don't know, and I don't really care about such things. What I care about is the tests, and the tests are lacking. It's premature to dismiss something like this. All right. Get my computer revved back up. Okay. However, this is not perfect. And so, how is it not perfect? I think it's incomplete. And I think, let me go back to this because it's simpler. I think perceived burdensomeness, the construct of it, is actually too tame a depiction of the suicidal mindset. It's a very painful state to believe that you're truly a burden on those that you love. That's painful. I'm starting to suspect that the lethally suicidal mindset is in a place that's even more painful than that. And it's that sense that I've already referred to of, where are we at here? To the full, far, right, full, far right here, a sense of irreparable decay of the self and a sense of unalterable detachment of the self from others. It's as if a piece of your agency or efficacy has died. Start to see the, the similarity to Cotard delusion. Cotard delusion patients believe they're dead. I'm starting to think these patients believe that a part of them are dead, and that part that has died is agency and efficacy. The very thing you need to not be a burden and to reconnect to others is dying and withering. They think. It's not really but they think that, they feel that. You can see why that would throw you into a painful spot, a suicidal spot, a hopeless spot. And the key therapeutically to all that is to gently, but repeatedly, and actually not so gently, insist that though you empathize with the pain, empathize with the hopelessness, that it's not so that it is possible to restore agency and efficacy and connection, that there is some hope. That's the, the goal. That's the optimal therapeutic sort of process. All right. The inflection point that I was talking about with regard to that incarcerated fellow, he has inflect, inflected, changed over in other words, with regard to his ability to kill, or at least inflict very heavy violence on others. In fact, that's why he's incarcerated, by the way, is that he did that very thing to other people. He's, he's inflected past that killing point. Has he inflected, though, past the dying point? That's what the suicidal mindset also requires, is coming to terms, full terms, with the dual prospect, not only of killing, but of dying both. And that is hard to do. Most people can't do it, even if they desire to do so. It's way too hard. Suicidal mindset, therefore, involves an alteration along two main parameters. One parameter is the self, suicidal self 
experienced and felt as irreparably decayed and unalterably alienated. Not so, but that's how it's felt. That's one parameter, one dimension. The other is the relationship to death and to killing and to dying. Most all of us have intact, fully intact, in this nervous system up here, mostly residing in regions like the amygdala and the insula, a fully intact fear, even a loathing of states like death and dying, not the fully suicidal mindset. Their relationship to death has altered. When those two alterings come together, altered self, altered relationship to death, got a dangerous problem. I want to talk a little bit more about the right side of the image. There's a second double line there. Those double lines, by the way, are meant to denote that that crossover point may be, especially the one farthest to the right, may be fully categorical in nature. In, in the sense that this is a spectrum or continuum kind of thing where you know, there's, no, there's no categories really, there's just a spectrum idea. Once you get to the far right, there is actually evidence that there is like a break point and that things to the right of the second double line are categorically different, qualitatively different than the things to the left. I've mentioned the decayed and detached self. I've mentioned Cotard delusion. Let me delve in a little bit more to ASCD. Got a slide on it. So that's what A, well, I've, so I've screwed this slide up. It, here it says ACSD, but it's, I got that mixed up. It's ASCD. You can see it there, acute suicidal crisis disorder. What is that? Here are the criteria that my colleague and I have created to define what we view as a standalone, distinct entity in nature. This condition we believe exists as an entity in nature and we think it's independent of other entities like mood disorders, for instance. Here are the criteria, a drastic increase in suicidal intent, in an acute time frame, this is happening quickly, we defined it as hours to days, not weeks to months, marked social or, and or self-alienation. If you don't have a sense of what that means, we were just talking about it with the decayed sense of self or the hopelessly detached. We're talking about those kind of states there. Again, the sense that these things are never gonna change, so the intractability aspect, hopelessness aspect, and then over arousal, and, and we've, we've kind of honed in on four manifestations of over arousal, namely agitation, irritability, uh, insomnia, and nightmares. Again, we think this is independent of something like a mood disorder or a reaction that one has after ingesting some sort of drug or some sort of agent or, or substance. Work is progressing to show that we have something here, that there's empirical evidence that this is independent from other states. For instance, this is really busy, but think of the red as the acute suicidal crisis symptoms. Think of the blue as GAD symptoms, generalized anxiety disorder symptoms, and think of the beige or tan or whatever that is as depression. This is a network analysis. You don't need to know the details other than the tighter, the tighter the, the, the clustering, the more cohesive a syndrome it is. That's A. Which is the most closely coherent of these three? It's the red. You can see the reds just, they're all clustered together. Very tight syndrome. Tighter than anxiety for sure in the blue and even tighter than depression, which is a pretty tight network in the beige. And then the lines between it, see the, the heaviness of the green lines connecting all the circles? That shows the strength of the network. 
real, real strong with regard to um, ACSD, less strong with GAD, pretty strong with depression. And then the crucial, crucial thing is the non-overlap of the networks. The red is not overlapping with the blue or, the, or with the blue or the beige. Pretty good evidence of distinctiveness of this symptom cluster from neighboring states. All right, any questions while we have the remaining six minutes? Yes, sir. Uh, die by uh, by uh, putting their head in the oven like was a tendency in the past because of uh, the formulation of natural gas. Um, and we know that states with higher uh, firearm ownership or occupations with fire, higher firearm um, access have much higher firearm uh, suicide rates. Qu one way to um, kind of pitch that question is, per each of these things, what do you do clinically? And this question is about per the capacity, the right side of the model, what do you do about that? You could, in a, as it were, try to change the capacity from within, in a sense. In other words, you try to make somebody who's fearless of death more fearful. You could try to do that. In fact, we have tried to do that experimentally, and we failed every time. And we think it's because this quality, once it's there, is pretty stable. It's mostly genetic, that quality, incidentally, which maybe has something to do with why it's hard to change internally. But what you can do is change things externally. And that's to your point about mean safety. You get somebody who's fearless and therefore could be dangerous if they were suicidal put distance between them and dangerous things. And that actually get, can get a little complicated with regard to firearms, but a lot less so than you might think when you take approaches like some of us are starting to do, led by Mike Anessis, he's sitting over there, he's gonna talk later about firearm and, and suicide related issues. He's here at the conference, he'll talk later today about it. There's a group that's starting to talk in ways that I think are talking across aisles to both sides of this issue about let's just get safer with this so that we lose fewer people to gun suicide. And actually, if you do it right, like Mike does, you can speak to, to both sides of this. Very, very ardent uh, opponents to one another on this issue can both listen to people like Mike and go, oh yeah, okay, I'm on board with that. It's promising. Yes. Hello? Oh, oh where, where are we at? Where are we at? I, I'm very curious about age involved in this. I work doing assessment on very young children. Yeah. And then at the end of my dad's life, he had he did not commit suicide, but he was suicidal at points. Yeah. So it seems like development, I'm not hearing yeah. how that affects it. Yeah. I, yesterday I said I view these ideas as universal across uh, dimensions like age. I do think they are. I think they affect humans. Uh, and we have data now on three-year-old humans and 83-year-old humans who are all suicidal. And these variables, you can detect them across the age. So I think they're universal in that sense. Now, just because they're universal underneath doesn't mean they don't express or manifest through this pr the prism of age or of culture or of what have you, lots of different variables like that. That happens. 83-year-old suicidal people talk about things like, I'm a, I'm a failed breadwinner or what have you. Three-year-old kids don't talk about that, obviously. Talk about different things, but underneath the theme is similar. Suicidal kids who are three and four and five years old, you might have a question do they even understand death? Do they even know what it is? You would think not. Suicidal three-year-olds have a superior understanding of death as compared to non-suicidal three-year-olds. 
It's actually the other way around, if anything. The suicidal kids understand death better than the non-suicidal kids. That's coming from the work of Joan Luby, psychiatrist, child psychiatrist, Wash U. Wash U in St. Louis. Where's the microphone? What? Here we go. Ow. Yeah, that's good. Um, I'm interested in that, the kind of scale of um, suicidal states and wondered as far as the Qatar delusion, does that relate at all to um, like major depressive disorder with mood congruent psychotic features? Yeah. I mean, is that part of that scale? Yeah, I should have mentioned that. Good. Thanks for reminding me of it. So when you see Kotar, first of all, Kotar delusion is extremely rare. I should, if I didn't mention that, I should. When it exists, though, the most common uh, background for it is exactly, as you said, a psychotic presentation of major depressive disorder. The second most common clinical presentation for it is, is from neurology. It's from stroke. Um, so it's so well known in neurology. It's actually better known in neurology than in psychiatry, is my impression leading people to dismiss it as merely a, a, a stroke injury, which is not true because it arises even more frequently in major depressive disorder absent stroke than it does in stroke per se. Yes. I'm wondering about the role that, I'm gonna pronounce this word wrong, anisognosia plays, where um, patients with severe mental illness or other mental illnesses don't recognize that they have an illness. Uh. Are the patients who are fall into the ACSD category, do they recognize? Yes, they do. Um, the, the, the Cotard patients don't. Um, they, they're genuinely under the impression that they're dead and that everyone who thinks that they're not is mistaken. They have a delusion. Um, but the, the, a, the ACSD crowd, they're quite aware of what's going on and, and it, it's a very painful experience. Um, so mostly in this space, that's the story. People are quite aware. They wish they weren't so aware of this painful crisis. The Cotard folks um, are an exception. For the acute, just um, one more chronic, then. For the acute yeah. chronic um, suicide disorder, yeah. can you, um, since that's been talked about for some time, can you tell us some of the benefits of if that were yeah. to be official? Like, what would that mean for practice and for help seeking? And, and what are some of the barriers to getting that approved? The advantages of it would be um, a couple things. One would be that if clinicians were aware of it and then aware of a history of it in their patients, that should inform that clinician's posture about safety with that patient going forward. It informs care prospectively based on a retrospective knowledge of the past occurrence of the condition. That would be the main reason for it. The other thing, though, is that therapeutics could be developed specifically for it. I don't know what those would be yet, but uh, that's another direction. Um, barriers. One that I'm worried about, and I think you might have alluded to it with help seeking, might be the discouragement of people who are labeled with it to, to seek treatment or the reluctance of clinicians who know of the label to treat patients like that. To me, though, that's a different thing. We, that's stigma in general, and we got to do better with that as a profession, mental health profession, um, not specific to that thing. The other barrier would just be very, the very high bar, scientifically and clinically, which should be in place to get things in to something like a DSM, a future DSM. Um, and that's what we're working on. Me and Igor, Igor Gallenker, are working on clearing that bar. I don't know if we're going to get there or not. We're trying. We'll see. Okay, I, I know I'm over time here. Uh, thank you again for having me. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you.